Hey friends, subscribers, potential new subscribers, welcome to the Evangelist Nick Garrett channel. Have I got some cool stuff for you today. We're in day six of creation in the book of Genesis. We're doing a video series breaking down day by day in the context of language. And today is the big deal. We all want to get to the phrase, let us make man in our own image. And we're going to get there. Today it's important, don't worry so much about watching. I'm going to be reading things from three sources that are crucial, but they're going to give you understanding that most people never even come close to. The listening is important. Don't watch if you have to. Listen with headphones. Close your eyes. I'll read it real slowly and clearly. Stay with me, though, because your mind is going to be totally blown. I give you that. So I'm going to start by reading the definition in Unger's Dictionary of the word Elohim, which is a plural form for the word God. But there's way more to it, as we're going to see. It says that Hebrew plural Elohim, singular Eloah, mighty, a term sometimes used in the ordinary sense of gods, whether true or false, including Jehovah. Dr. W. Henry Green, in his uh, September 1898 article, thus summarizes the principles regulating the use of Elohim and Jehovah in the Old Testament. Jehovah represents God in his special revelation to the chosen people, as revealing himself to them, their guardian and object of their worship. Elohim represents God in his relation to the world at large as creator, providential ruler in the affairs of men, and controlling the operation of nature. Elohim is also used when Gentiles speak or are spoken to or spoken about, unless there is a specific reference to Jehovah, the God of the chosen people. Elohim is used when God is contrasted with men or things, or when the sense requires a common rather than a proper noun. Now, let's jump into day six. Let's read it word for word in the English. And God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping things and beasts of the earth after his kind, and it was so. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind, and cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind, and God saw that it was good. And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth." So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in the which is the fruit of the tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat, and to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to every thing that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life. I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day." So, first of all, you probably notice that this day goes on way longer than the other ones do. More than one thing happens in this day. The earth is essentially now uh, put living creatures where God had produced fruit, vegetation, grass, night and day, back on day three. Let the land produce its living creatures. Kinds. The word kinds is important here. It's repeated over six times in day six. It's just repeated over and over again. When we get to the Latin and Spanish, there's more to reveal there. He talks about livestock, animals that move on the ground, and wild animals, three separate categories, and God saw that it was good. And then in verse 26, we get, let us make man in our image. Well, Elohim is a plural term for a singular God. Remember how we talked about bara, the verb, but that it's only ever used with God as the subject? That's a little different than the way we speak in English. In English, we have a pronoun, I, you, he, she, it, we, you all. And then we have a verb that gets conjugated. I run, you run, 
he, she, it runs. We run, you all run. But when you're using a verb like bara, the creative verb of God, only God can be used with it. There's a precedent for language being used like this, but as we're going to see, this dilemma over Elohim, which we love to stick in as a precursor to what happens later with the Nephilim, I'm sorry to say really isn't the right way to interpret it. There's not a great mystery with the word Elohim being used. This is revealed in Latin, where the word is just deus. In English, it's God. In Spanish, it's dios. In German, it's Gott. There's no language that reveals this to be some special secret hidden thing. That being said, when you get to the pictograph and the ancient Hebrew, the um, uh, Paleo-Hebrew, there are some very interesting things that happen. I know this is a controversial subject that you can glean biblical meaning out of the ancient Hebrew pictographs. I definitely believe there's something to it, and we're going to get to that in just a second. So Elohim, as we said, is the plural for a singular God. That means the singular would be Eloha, Eloa, right? El. El stands out. Elohim is the general term for God. It's a standalone term, but it's often accompanied. El Ohim, El Shaddai, uh, El Bel, Baal, all these things are connected together. The meaning of the word God as creator is separated from all the false gods. It's separated from the gods of Canaan, the gods of Akkad, the gods of Mesopotamia. But linguistically, there are connections and there is a lineage for these things. For example, uh, in Aramaic, it's Elah. Elah sounds like Allah. And in fact, it's used in the same way. There were Jewish tribes in Arabia well up to the time of uh, Muhammad forming the uh, Muslim religion in the 7th century, the early 600s, uh, Banu Koresa, uh, Banu Nadir, and there was a third very famous tribe that's part of the narrative for the formation of Islam, but I can't remember the name of the third group, but they are talked about in my book, Just Tell Me the Truth About the Holy Land Crusades, which you can get for your Kindle or paperback. It's an easy read, 200 pages, covers the nine Holy Land Crusades, and the first chapter is the formation of Islam, obviously. So El is the word used for God, but not exclusive to the Hebrews. As I just said, Bel, right, or Baal. Uh, but we do see it in the Bible. There are additions to El to convey God's attributes. We now study God's attributes as an important entire subject in its own. Well, in the Hebrew, the language was used to just convey, um, you know, uh, God Almighty, God the Strong, God the Maker of Heavens, the God of the Waters, the God of the Earth, the God of the Sea, Elah, Elohim, El Hadai. The Akkadian Sadu mentions God on high, or the mountains, or the high places, and we read about the high places of the Canaanite religion too. Now let me get into the pictograph, the ancient Paleo, the Paleo Hebrew, and its meaning. For Elohim, first drop all the vowels, E and O, for Elohim, E-L-O-H-I-M. So we're going to drop E, O, and I, and we're going to take the L, the H, a Y, and an M, Chlichim, Lamed, He, Yod, and Mem. Well, Lamed has the shepherd's crook, and it means uh, staff, teach, to and from, He is a a little man holding his hands above his head, and it means to behold, to reveal, or to breathe. Yod is the outstretched arm, which means work, or deed, or worship. And chmem is water, chaos, or blood. So to take those four terms for Elohim and to mix them together in various combinations, you get things like, behold the shepherd's chaotic work. Um, think of the names of the four rivers surrounding the Garden of Eden, rapid, increase, um, chaotic work, rapid. Um, the, the words we've seen in Latin are to produce, right? Uh, and rapidity and uh, vibration, vivacious, right? So it's happening quick and energetically. The shepherd's bloody chaos is revealed. That's very interesting. Does it mean bloody chaos like war, like we talk about, or does it mean um, the birth of an individual, right? There's blood and fluid during the birth, and then Jesus in John 3 talks about being born of water and of spirit. Uh, I think that's interesting. Uh, The teacher breathed his work into the water. Uh, Remember the Mesopotamian god Ea was the god of water. Well, we removed E-O-I from... 
Elohim, Ea, Eo, Earth, Ea, Rth. God, uh, Jesus talks about being born of water and of spirit. These, again, strange connections. Um, so in the Aramaic, if you take the pictographs, the paleo, you get ox, window, hand, and water. Well, that's kind of different. We can maybe talk about water in the context of Ea. Uh, we can talk about the ox being strength, like Aleph, the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, when talking about God, is used to signify strength or the Almighty. Um, a quick point. Okay, next I'm going to... All right, this is where you got to listen closely, okay? Because I'm reading L and God from Vine's Expository Dictionary, which breaks down the Hebrew and the Greek. I'm going to jump around a little bit, but don't worry about watching. Just listen closely. L, God. The term was the most common general designation of deity in the ancient Near East. While it frequently occurred alone, El was also combined with other words to constitute a compound term for deity or to identify the nature and function of the God in some manner. Thus, the expression God, the God of Israel, identified the specific activities of Israel's God. Isra, El, is real Israel? There's only a flip of one letter to go from Israel to Israel. It's only a slight alteration, S, light, alter, ration, alter, to change, or a edifice for worshiping, and ration, to control or limit, but provide regularly. These language ties are so fascinating to me. In the ancient world, knowledge of a person's name was believed to give one power over that person. Remember the revelation of uh, the fifth day of creation and the video we did on deep Genesis where we talked about Genesis 11 and, we, and they built the city and they said, come, let us make a name for ourselves. Well, according to this, in the ancient world, knowledge of a person's name was believed to give one power over that person. There's a great tie that provides the historical precedent for what we were reading in scripture. A knowledge of the character and attributes of pagan gods was thought to enable the worshippers to manipulate or influence the deities in a more effective way than they could have if the deity's name remained unknown. To that extent, the vagueness of the term El frustrated persons who hoped to obtain some sort of power over the deity, since the name gave little or no identification of God's character. This was particularly true for El, the chief Canaanite god. The ancient Semites stood in mortal dread of the superior powers exercised by the gods, the Nephilim, and attempted to propitiate them accordingly. The com they commonly associated deity with the manifestation and use of enormous power. Perhaps this is reflected in the curious Hebrew phrase, the power, El, of my hand. It is my power. Some Hebrew phrases in the Psalms associated El with impressive natural features, such as the cedar trees of Lebanon. Cedar trees of Lebanon are referred to in the um, story of Gilgamesh, the Epic of Gilgamesh. He was in there. Uh, names with El as one of their components were common in the Near East in the second millennium, too. The name Methusael, Me'el Kizedek, Melek Zedek, the two words that go together to create that. Uh, the city of bread, the prince of peace in the city of bread, Melchizedek. Um, and finally, I want to say uh, certain scholars regard the word as being a singular version of the common plural form Elohim, a plural of majesty. Eloah, Aramaic Elah, Arabic Allah. Eloah is commonly thought to be vocative in nature, meaning, O oh God, but it is not clear why the special form for the vocative in an address to God should be needed since the plural Elohim is frequently translated as a vocative when the worshiper is speaking directly to God. We're going to set that aside. So thanks for staying with me for that part. That is uh, a lot of information. I know it is. Now let's touch base on a few points here with our sixth day of creation. First of all, there's clear that no meat eating is taking place. God gave fruits and vegetables to be for food and for meat. When we look at this in Latin, and it was so, factumque est ita, fact, 
That's interesting to me, the, the word that we use for fact, right? When God says, and it, or when the Bible says, and it was so, the Latin tells us, and it was fact. Producat, we see that root for what we would use, produce, living souls. So in Genesis on the sixth day, God is producing living souls to put on the earth. Reptila bestias secundum species. He created animals both general and specific. Remember, we saw kinds used repeatedly. Uh, in 126, when we get to let us make man in our image, facia hominem ad imaginum similitudinum nostrum. Facia, we, we hear face in that. Hominem is the word for man, which is funny. Think of ad hominem or how we use the word hominem in English. Hominid in science. Um, human, but it's the word man. Facia hominem imaginum image or imagine, right? Imagine the face of man like us. Similitudinum, similarities. We're going to make man with the similarities of face that we have. Uh, nostrum, nostrils, breathe. Um, universicae, universally control. Give man universal control. Make him in our image, give him universal control. The man and the serpent, along with all the other creatures, are created on day six. Starts with s. s. Uh, in all the languages, we get six serpent. It sounds like snake hissing. English is six. Latin is sex. Spanish is seis. German is sex. All these things have that uh, that kind of strong s sound. So anyway, as we can see, Elohim is way deeper than we could have imagined, but it's not deep in the ways we were thinking it was. It's not an allusion to a board of gods or the Nephilim. It's separate. But I guess you could interpret the pictographic meaning as some sort of uh, trickery or violence toward man, but there's way other, there's other meanings that can be gleaned from that as well. Um, I do think it's, it seems to me that the Elohim translation is only a problem comparing Hebrew and English. As we saw in Spanish, Latin, German, it's always God. It's just God. It's just God, right? It doesn't get complicated till you transfer Hebrew into English. But that's also then when we start to see the connections to the mythological sounds. Is Ra El? Is Ra El? Is real? Slight alteration, alter ration. All right, my friends, thank you. We're going to continue this talk, get into day seven. There's much more to go. We're making a video right now on sacred geometry and that sonic supernaturalism before we get out of the days of creation because it's relevant to that subject. I want to thank you for being here with me today. Uh, please take a look at the books I've written. I wrote a series of books called Just Tell Me the Truth About Christianity. There's three out now and the fourth to be out by Christmas. The first one is on the early church councils. The second one is on the Holy Land Crusades. The third one is on the future of the church. Each of these books you can get for paperback or for your Kindle. Amazon.com slash author slash Nicholas Garrett. The Kindle versions I think are like $2.99. It's really not much, but it helps me continue to do the work that I do. You can also purchase my nonfiction history, Shipwrecked in the Land of King Tobacco, the first Washington family immigrant to America. It tells the story of where George Washington came from through his great-grandfather John Washington's world and eyes. It's a fascinating story that reveals a lot of truth about Jamestown, the relationship with the Indians in the area, and Bacon's Rebellion. So I hope you take a look at it and enjoy it. You can also get things from our Teespring store. My favorite are these Truth First Christianity coffee mugs. They say Truth First Christianity on one side, and on the other side they have St. Andrew's Cross. Uh, you can look at various t-shirts we have. We have There Were Nephilim on the Earth in Those Days hoodies and t-shirts for men and women. I really appreciate your support. Please subscribe if you're interested in some of the videos we put out that way and click on all notifications so you can see and choose if you want to watch the videos we put out or not. Uh, you'll have the opportunity to support if you want every time we do live streams and super chats and uh, I look forward to seeing you on those. Thank you so much for your time and I look forward to talking to you on the next one. May your work today bear fruit. Thanks. <laughs>